as I was telling yesterday that uh, because MEG, I'm not aware of if there is MEG facilities in India or not. So, you may not use uh, the MEG in possibly in a very near future, but at the same time it is always good to know at least the basics there because things are changing hopefully whether you go abroad or, or maybe in some labs uh, they might procure MEG. Yeah, so, I will try to keep it very basic, it is a very high, I mean I instrumentations of EEG is very straightforward because you are just measuring a potential there, yeah, but instrumentation of MEG is a much more complicated, there is a lot of uh, physics involved. So, I will give you a brief flavor, you can I, I mean avoiding the details, but if you are interested okay, if you really uh, in terms of biomedical physics uh, I can tell you some kind of secondary sources or primary sources where you can look for more information. So, that is the first part today, I will we are going to scheme over the, the, the principles behind the magnetoencephalography and the s after the break I will keep it open there. So, I thought so far I have been talking constantly, so it will be nice opportunity for both of us to kind of having an open ended discussions uh, for an hour or so, uh, where we I like to hear what you want to do or, or, or kind of a little bit more details. If you have any open queries and any open questions you may have uh, about your project or, or about uh, this particular course or whatever you have learned or what you want to learn. So, I will keep it a more open. So, feel free to, to shoot questions uh, uh, after the break there. So, so, yesterday uh, we introduced or briefly discussed about the, the history of, of recording uh, neural signals in, in, in humans. That just to recap, that it, it somehow started uh, in England, uh, I would say the primarily the history of recording in humans, but in terms of recording electricity in, in, in livings that started well before that. But Richard Catton was the first uh, electrophysiologist, or actually he was a surgeon, uh, who showed that it is possible to record uh, electrical activity non-invasively, and that was picked up. We talked yesterday by by the German, the Dr. Hans Hans Berger, there, and he just kind of uh, invented the first EEG machine or the first amplifier, one channel, and showed very nicely that you can uh, record. Uh, non-invasively the, the electrical activities of the brain by, by placing electrodes. And once the Berger uh, somehow reported his the outcome of his findings, it created a, a lot of interest in, in, in that time in, in 1930s then. Then it created a lot of interest in it primarily in England there picked up by, by Lord Adrian who was a very well known uh, physiologist in nine, uh, he was a president of the Royal Society, got a Nobel Prize afterwards there. So, he was Lord Adrian as well as uh, uh, Charles Sherrington, they are both quite captivated by this new found possibilities to, to monitor the brain. And, and remember, I am I'm talking about 1930s, so it is you, have to, you have to take yourself back quite a while back. But although at the same time they realized the potential that this new technique of electroencephalography have kind of unprecedented access to the human brain non invasively, but they are also quite aware that this is a very kind of cumbersome methods, because you really uh, need to make sure the good contacts, I mean those time only single channel amplifier or maybe you can lucky two channel amplifier, but yesterday we talked about you see here if the conduct some of our contacts are not very good between the electrodes and the scalp, then your signal becomes very noisy. So, this is quite in funny comments I found it, which was published almost 70 years back by, by Lord Adrian. And he, uh, he mentioned that with present methods, the skull and the scalp are too much in the way. The in the way means way in the way from signal reaching from the brain to the recording apparatus. And he said, we need some new physical method to read through them. There. And in these days, we may look with some confidence to the physicists and to produce such an instrument, for it is just the sort of thing that they can do. Yeah. 
So, he somehow already had the sense of highlighting that yes, this is a kind of getting a field where we need or the physiologist need to collaborate with other experts and here he somehow kind of if you consider 70 years back it is n it's quite a quite an amazing kind of vision to ask for for expertise from a different disciplines there now we take in interdisciplinary as a granted but that's not the traditionally the case usually often the science works as a very modular so lord adrian so he uh, already you can see here it is published in nature one of the premier journals that still now that that's in order to to get uh, the more out of okay uh, this this procedures to, to how to record brain signals he realized that we really need to, uh, or or at least that time it is important that the different fields or different expert experts get together and if you talk about uh, because eeg is nothing but recording electrical activities of human brain and by that time the field or there has been an uh, quite an established knowledge that electricity and magnetism they go hand in hand there because that's the kind of contribution by, uh, by James Clerk Maxwell that was in, in in 19th century the Scottish physicist so he he actually convincingly showed theoretically the famous formula for quite a fundamental contributions that this electricity and magnetism are 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 fundamentally linked to each other you take a conductor very simple you just pass a current it will generate a magnetic field there and similarly if you apply a magnetic field it will generate an electrical current there so this you cannot talk one without the other there so now those times you think of if the brain is generating uh, electrical field and EEG is the technique to, to pick up those electrical field. So, naturally by simple Maxwell's law, it is also generating magnetic field there. So, how to, to somehow pick up those magnetic field. Although Adrian did not mention anything about magnetic field in his commentary there, but somehow it is already kind of implicit uh, uh, appeal or implicit uh, I would say the uh, a point that uh, the physiologists were looking only for the electrical activities either they have to kind of step up their game of how to make it better or to also to kind of team up with the physicists to, to look for other types of signals. But it was not later on picked up that these possibilities of picking a magnetic field I think one reason or another you will see that. Uh, uh, well, picking up electrical f activities is a challenge, but picking up magnetic activities from the generated in the brain is actually more than a challenge, just because it is a terribly, terribly weak there. But in terms of if you look into the history of picking up activities, magnetic activities generated by the body there. So, one of the first kind of empirical evidence there presented by, by this Gerard Ball and, and and Richard McPhee in, in early 60s from the Syracuse University. So, they came up with a very simple solutions to detect magnetic field from the heart there. Because also heart also uh, the magnetic field generated by the heart is rather low amplitudes. So, what he did is a primarily use a multiple turns of where that they used to call the million turns. So, you have to give a turn, turn, turn and that is there were these multiple turns were wound around the coil the core of the coil and to, to, to compensate because usually the arts magnetic field is usually much stronger than the most of the magnetic field produced by the body and especially here in this case is the heart there. So, to compensate for that so they use the two identical coils wound in a opposite directions. So, then that will cancel out each other the, the stronger magnetic field of the arts. That was the first demonstration kind of as far as I know uh, of the re recording of magnetic field generated by body here in this case is the heart. And if you see as I mentioning earlier that uh, what is the strength of the magnetic field produced by the brain and if you see here so that is the kind of uh, roughly uh, distributions a rough magnetic I mean amplitudes of arc magnetic field on the top then there is an urban noise there I mean although this is not an urban noise this is more like electrical noise even a passing car creates a magnetic field 
because this is a moving vehicle. Then if you apply a screwdriver, anything moving that creates a magnetic field metallic. And then comes the electronic circuit if it is a 2 meter and then you see uh, uh, the brain activity at almost at the bottom. So, or literally the earth magnetic field almost 100 billion stronger there. So, now there lies the problem there. So, the tiny magnetic field generated by the by our individual brain that is billions even more than billion times weaker than the magnetic field generated by the earth. So, how the hell or how can we measure it there. So, that was the principal problem and the brain ok just give in another one. So, ok on and also the gen the magnetic field we generate that also changes depending on ok what we are doing it even if you clenching clenching teeth that is not generated by the brain, but that generates stronger magnetic field. So, it is like yesterday also I showed you when you record the EEG that it pick up a lot of artifacts and those are signals are not necessarily generated by the brain, but still picked up by the amplifier. Now, similarly here, so uh, even or if you wear suppose a dental fixture that would create a very high magnetic field or if you have an implantation metallic implantation that would generate much stronger magnetic field compared to the field generated in your brain there. So, this signal mag I mean this magnetic uh, activities generated in the brain are indeed very very weak there, but it is there. So, now the challenge is how can we pick up these weak activities theoretically is existence we know I mean the researchers knew long back the problem is the technical challenge. And this technical challenge is first somehow taken by, uh, uh, by David Cohen uh, who I was fortunate to meet quite long back who was that time at the Illinois University there. So, he made a, a kind of uh, shielded chamber because you see here I already talked about the earth magnetic field is very strong and anything electronic noises or even a car urban noises that produces magnetic field stronger than the brain. So, you have to shield right. So, in order to produce in order to uh, um, kind of measure the magnetic field generated by the brain. So, you have to shield wherever you are recording your participant. So, he was the one of the first at, at least uh, as far as we know that who, who addresses or, or who, who kind of kind of took on this challenge and he made a first shielded room that was in 1967 there. So, then first what he did naturally those time literature was very scarce about the magnetic kind of biomagnetism let us put it like that. So, a few years back researchers showed that earlier I showed that this magnetic field generated by the brain. There. So, he first checked that whether in his shielded room whether he could record uh, the magnetic uh, f kind of magnetic signals generated by the heart. And then once he could verify then could validate then he went on to, to record the magnetic uh, responses generated by the brain. So, that is the first recording actually published in science uh, almost 50 years back. So, you can see here the the, the kind of one cycle so, and that is the alpha cycle, but that is one cycle he needed almost 10 minutes of data. Why? Because signal is very weak buried in noise. So, you need a lots and lots and lots and lots of repetition there and then after having a lots and lots of repetitions then you do average then only you can ex re extract this is signal of your interest there. So, down there you can see down there there is the signal trace uh, which is pretty much noise there. So, but nevertheless this is you can consider ok I mean uh, as a technical achievement it was it was very impressive there, but the whole recording was cumbersome you have to consider if just having a one cycle of brain rhythms you have to wait for 10 minutes and that would vary for depending on what brain rhythms you are going to consider uh, or you want to use. So, but nevertheless this yes huh? or the instruments they it is still not squid yet. So, instrument I have to I think they use a similar this million turn coils same thing just more turns there. 
shield made of good questions. I have to check it. I mean, this is definitely early days of shielding. Uh, maybe aluminium, I believe. There, you can tell whether those time aluminium was more popular because because mu metal was not there. Those time, the mu metal was not there that time. Or maybe the Mm-hmm. I think because considering that time, I do not have the exact information, but I, I can check it if you are interested historical aspect. I mean definitely the shield is always with a, a kind of as you mentioned the kind of layered materials. I do not know exactly which material they use, can't, I do not remember, but we can check it out, should be historically it should be there, there. But then later on because still he used this, uh, this, this kind of a turn coils, those are not, I mean better than nothing, but still not very okay, impressive. So, then in 1970s there, so, so the James Zimmerman from the Ford company, they first one of the first to, to invent the squid. Squid is the superconducting quantum interference device there. And although the theoretically the, the I mean it's essentially it is superconductivity is like close to zero resistance of electrical conduction that typically occurs at a very very low temperature, almost close to near absolute uh, zero. And this theoretical prediction was made long before by this brand Josephson's in in, in I think in early 1960s. So, because his prediction was later verified in, in 70s, so he got the Nobel Prize there. So, in the operation of a squid, primarily, okay, I mean, this is again you are going into the deep kind of core of physics. I am just giving a very basic idea. So, you will have a four basic superconducting phenomena are used. The first is you have a almost a complete loss of electrical resistance below the critical temperature. The second, you have, uh, I think, the perfect diamagnetism having no magnetic flux inside the superconductor. Third is you are using the Josephson uh, junction that is proposed by him theoretically by Brian Josephson and, and the fourth is there is a quantization of magnetic flux in a superconducting ring. And so, that is the one of the first squid uh, proposed or, or, or kind of made in 1970 and that was this information was then picked up by David Cohen there. So, then a okay, moment I possibly would have here this one. Then he used now instead of this million turn coil instead of coil now he used the squid there because squid is because of his extremely low or extremely high sensitivity on the weak picking up weak magnetic field. So, he used the one channel squid and then also he improved his shielding a bit again I cannot remember exactly what modifications he did, but that is the room you can see here on the shielding and uh, he, he is actually you can hear picture is not clear. I can see he is in the middle David Cohen and these two are his collaborator. So, he now repeated his experiment using squid as as the detector there and and that is you can see here now the signal using the say uh, one channel squid from the this traditional EKG or, or, or other neuromagnetic responses here now it is much clearer there you do not need to wait for 10 minutes to get a one cycle. Now, you can see is a very nice this is the MEG with the squid the first one of the first recorded MEG. So, continuous MEG and you can see the very nice oscillations there that usually you can see also with the EEG and and you can see also the the MCG which is a magnetocardiogram there which is almost as uh, similar as the electrocardiogram there. So, this was a quite a landmark paper uh, published I think in 1972 I think in science where he demonstrated that the possibility of using squid uh, to, to measure uh, very small weak magnetic uh, signals generated in the brain. So, that is the paper uh, that is the picture coming from the uh, this paper science paper.
although here actually he also recorded, if I recall correctly, it's nine, okay, almost before I was born. Uh, I think it looks like these are activities, okay, some kind of epileptic spikes. So means patients have some epilepsy. So it's not a. I don't doesn't look like to me an healthy okay uh, healthy brain. It's not the point actually he wanted to make. He wanted to make that it is possible there with this new. I mean uh, because he just used the technology almost very very new because seventy the squid came in and and then he published this paper in seventy two. So it was application of the latest technology. So that's. An, an excellent example. So, how the uh, the progression in one field can really um, introduce or can change or cause a paradigm shift in, in another field. There. So, an excellent example of interdisciplinarity. And briefly, so this is again a very very rough sketch of of the MEG, but actual instrumentation is a very complicated. So, I don't think you're possibly interested. But nevertheless, just to give you what primarily happens. So, this figures as I mentioned shows the kind of principle of measuring an MEG signal using a squid. So, now from the you can see here is the oval shape that is called the pickup coil. So, in order to, uh, to, to pick up the magnetic field signal. So, now a, a superconductive we call flux transformer is used and this flux transformer they consist of the pickup coil which is usually a much larger diameter than the squid loop there. And also, you have a multiple input coil into inside this superconductive this flux transformer circuit, and then this current is afterwards converted into magnetic flux through the input coil, and then magnetic coupling with the squid loop. There, so that's very very simple way. And then it is afterwards outside the the this this squid there is electronic circuit which convert it to the voltage. There. So, usually typical dimension of, of, of a standard squids are about 0.1 millimeter and since the pickup coil has to be much larger there. So, there are different versions of the pickup coil there how what kind of pickup coils and this is again lot of changes okay uh, I mean as I make as I am talking more progress are being made, but on average you have a three types of pickup coils are used there one is called the magnetometer there you can see on your left. Another is axial or they call it first order axial gradiometer or the first order planar gradiometer. So, magnetometer, so, so this is about what kind of coil should be used okay, within this pickup coil circuitry. If you are interested in measuring the magnetic activities from the deeper as well as shallow sources, then magnetometer is your choice. The magnetometer is just a single coil you can see here on your very uh, left there, but although they are mm, quite sensitive to, 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 to the shallow as well as deep, but they are also very prone to noise there. And as you can as in I am um, telling here that MEG of the or MEG is a very small. So, you want to do definitely not introducing further noise or you do not want your your system to be very sensitive on noise there, but at the same time magnetometer is also quite sensitive on both superficial as well as deeper sources. So, if you want to have a m better noise cancelling kind of pickup coils, then you can choose either first order axial gradiometer or first order planar gradiometer. They both are better because of the double coil there, because double coil the advantage is that if there is an external other noise sources, it is picked up by the both coils, but the coils are in opposite direction. So, that they cancel the each other out in terms of uh, external magnetic field there. So, that is a principle of having the double coil, whether you want to have it in an axial or, or axis or a plane that has an implications on their sensitivity there. Suppose, axial gradiometer they are more sensitive to deeper sources, planar gradiometer they are more sensitive on the shallow sources. Well, shallow sources mean sources in the brain I am talking about here. And in the practice nowadays in order to get the best of the both worlds often the latest MEG uh, they use a mixture of magnetometer and the gradiometer. Uh, so, you can have a uh, kind of both some some pickup coils which are very sensitive on picking up 
neural activities, although they might be slightly noisy there and others are less noisy, but they are picking up either more activities from the deeper or more activities from the surface regions of the brain. That is right, yes. Uh, let me see if I have a picture. Do, do, do. No, I do not have a picture. That is right, pickup coils are placed on the scalp in a helmet. Okay. Yeah. So, now I showed you earlier this the big cumbersome one channel okay, um, uh, MEG system. So, now this is after 40 years. So, that is usually the current state, which is much sleek and posh you do not see all the sophisticated instrumentations and that is all hiding behind this big gantry there. And so, this is uh, I think it is yeah that is a pickup call you can see that is a helmet there. So, in, in they have an this one particularly if I think there are 102 okay, uh, uh, locations. So, if you use a similar analogy we have an EEG suppose electrodes we do not MEG there is no electrode here. So, these are each one check it yeah so each one has uh, these are 102 location and each location has three pickup coils uh, and now you can combine whether you have a one magnetometer or two gradiometer so that's how the MEG look like so you don't see anything uh, instrumentations but it cost a whooping i think 3 to 4 million dollar so it's a very very expensive uh, device and not only that it needs at least okay uh, 100000 uh, to 200,000 dollar to maintain every year because you have to replenish the liquid helium there because all the superconducting the squids are inside okay uh, there there is a we call it dewar okay there and this dewar which is a superconduct squid and that is immersed kept inside the liquid helium chamber and that liquid helium you have to replenish every year there so it's a very expensive uh, piece of kit and that could be one reason. So, although this technology was available in 70s there, then it was not picked up almost 20 years there for one reason or another until from 1990s okay, so there have been a okay, uh, more efforts or, or companies are more interested to make this kind of uh, MEG device there. And you can see you have a two versions. You can lie down and you can you can sit, and you have to make sure that while you record. So that's where the the pickup coil is inside here, the helmet. So this helmet somehow fits your brain as close as possible because if there is any gap or if it doesn't fit well, okay, it creates a, a lot of hard. You don't you don't pick up the magnetic field actually. Your data would be quite unreliable there. And um, another important is, uh, or very important, you you are almost you cannot move, or you are not supposed to move. That any tiny movement would distort your signal quite significantly. There, any micro movement. So here, so literally, you have to uh, sit st or lie down very very still. There. And what is important? Okay, you also other than this okay equipment, you also need a shielding room and that is a must there, because without shielding you cannot record MEG at least current technology wise not yet we do not know in the future it is possible there. Uh, so, in and depending on what kind of shielding you use okay, that is a uh, lot of research is done there and also depends on what uh, kind of usage you use in the hospital settings because MEG because it is so expensive there it is primarily used even in abroad primarily set it up in a clinical settings established clinical settings because it is too expensive to maintain by you can, but just to maintain. So, that is a hospital they have possibly the resources to allocate. So, in the clinical settings okay, they have a different requirement of, of this magnetic shielding room MSR we call them there. And it depend on how you want to shield I mean each uh, okay I mean MSR has a different sensitivity characteristics there because what kind of material you are going to use to to I mean for creating this magnetic shielding room there. Nowadays it is primarily used this this I call it mu metal this is a, which is a high perme permeability with the nickel uh, alloy 
there, but that is very brittle as far as I know, and I am not a okay, professor possibly you know better, it needs a really careful handling as far as I know, I am not a part of any installations, but first of all it is very expensive there, but it has this upside is it can really attenuate uh, okay, a lot of noises, external noises because that is what you want to achieve there. Otherwise, once you get the the signal, the, or once you uh, can record the neuromagnetic responses, in terms of analysis, you can apply very much very similar analysis, just like you do it for the uh, EEG. You have to, if you are interested in just like event related, we do not call it potential event related field. It is the same procedures, you have to repeat your stimulus many times, you record your MEG and then do the averaging. So, I do not include it here, yesterday we talked about uh, how to do those things. And uh, I think it is a combine, combine nah. and every location has this uh, three, three coils usually. Nah. And you can, I think you have the flexibility to choose whether how, what combinations you, what kind of coil you want, whether kind of axial or, or, or planar. Invariably, they have a one magnetometer because just a very kind of high sensitivity there. And quite a bit of, I avoided that, quite a bit of research has been done or been undergoing how to do a lot of cancelling, noise cancelling in the software. It is developing more advanced algorithms there and especially primarily to model your environment. That is what you need to do because MEG is not portable, once it is there it is there. So, you have to have a very good model of your environmental disturbance there and once you have a good model there in the how your environmental disturbance, then you can use it in the software okay, for as an offline noise calculations or offline noise eliminations. Okay, so now, if you ask the, uh, because yesterday we talked about EEG and actually once EEG is introduced, people in st immediately start comparing EEG with MEG, because principally EEG and MEG, they are picking up same neural activities, source is the same there. In the EEG, you are just picking up primarily electrical, I mean only electrical activities and MEG is picking up the magnetic field out of the electrical activities, out of the flow of ions, out of the flow of currents there, but the sources are the same. It is exactly yesterday we talked about okay, the summation of postsynaptic potentials there. It is all originated or, or source of neural ac uh, neuromagnetic activities is again summation of postsynaptic potentials and summation of postsynaptic potentials, especially same pyramidal neurons there and in order for the for the magnetic field to go or to be picked up outside your your scalp there because your squid is here outside the scalp you need all the neurons to be arranged again in the very same parallel fashion otherwise your individual uh, magnetic field would not be summed up there so everything is the same neurophysiology there in eeg and meg yeah only difference is there. EEG detects both radial and tangential sources there and it although it is a more sensitive on the radial sources there or the radial sources means radial dipoles or the pyramidal radial pyramidal cells, pyramidal cells which are radially distributed there. MEG is a maximally sensitive to the tangential dipoles because they are reasonably almost blind to the radial dipoles there. So, this is I gave around simple schematic, uh, just a second, I am just checking my pointer, should have somewhere. You can see, so this is the scalp surface here and that is a one pyramidal cell there. So, this is we call it uh, the basal, uh, 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 the dendrite that is a cell body and that is apical dendrite there. So, here, so you can, if you remember that each of the, the, the dendritic end, it is connected with a another a neuron, end of another neuron. So, that is the synapse there. And depending on whether it is an excitatory or it is inhibitory, okay, the change of 
potential there will be more ion negative ion outside because especially in these cases this is a excitatory synaptic connection because that is why there are more negative ions outside and more positive ions inside the cell. So, that creates a small change in the ion concentration there. So, that creates a small potential differences here and now naturally to complete the circuit ions should going to flow here. So, inside then there will be more negative outside there will be more positive and this simple you can then because the ions flow or a shorter distance you can approximate in terms of as a dipole. So, that is the concept of the dipole there and in order for all these dipoles the to be picked up activities of this dipole to be picked up from the brain uh, from the scalp which is a little bit farther up. So, you need all these small small tiny dipoles to be arranged in a very parallel form there. So, you need another pyramidal cells okay, in the same directions in the same uh, geometrically aligned spatially aligned and like that. So, all the dipoles then e kind of approximated by an, we call it equivalent current dipole there you just summed up there. And what the EEG is picking up is the same as the electrical activities generated by the equivalent current dipole and MEG is the same like the magnetic field there which is created by the equivalent current dipole. And now, the problem is you can see here if the pyramidal cells are like this there current is going like that that is fine the potential differences you can pick up, but the magnetic field is like this there simple right hand rule you know there. So, if you if you present if you are just if you the current is going like that and the magnetic field is around this conductor like that. So, here magnetic field is not leaving the head. So, that is why and the your squid is here. So, that is the reason if the cells are perpendicular there or the radial to the surface then magnetic field or a or MEG is quite blind there. But in order for the MEG or the magnetic field to go out, so what you need your cells to be like this geometrically aligned like that, but then what happens then the magnetic field is generated like that. So, then you can see here once this the neuronal neurons are aligned like this then the magnetic field is there and then it has a chance to go out, then it can a chance to reach your sensors means your squid. So, this is where the MEGs that is why this that is we call it the tangential dipoles those dipoles which are oriented as a tangent to the surface there. So, MEG is sensitive and EEG actually pick up both EEG does not ok uh, although EEG is more sensitive to this, but EEG picks up both radial and tangential, but MEG picks up mainly tangential activities there, but the radial is very insensitive there because magnetic field just stays inside the head does not get out and because it is very weak you have no way to reach that. So, yes, what is the resistivity depends on ok I mean uh, there is no I mean it is not a homogeneous medium as you know there it depends on the which layer you are talking about there because you have a say on the scalp then you have a say a quite a lot of layers the dura I forgot the names then there is cerebrospinal fluid there and then ok each layer has a different resistivity, but you can model it there is a good model there how the current flows uh, in 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 those mediums there. There are models there are models yes there are models there are there are actually quite a good models there. But on 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 average, usually, okay, there uh, uh, radial dipoles. You can see its MEG is difficult to pick up. Tangentials, it's a uh, more sensitive on the tangentials and the sources. And usually, the how the way the brain folds there, and it is where the south side. That's where the fold is there. That's where you are expect to get tangential dipoles there. So it's a primarily. MEG picks up activities primarily from the sulci from the neocortex. So, when there is a fold there. So, that is a one very very important uh, uh, a point uh, or which distinguishes the activity of MEG activity of MEG although they are both pick up 
uh, the origin of the both of their originated in the pyramidal cells there and the postsynaptic neurons there and all the sum of postsynaptic potentials, but the sensitivity is different. MEG is more sensitive on the tangential uh, sources and that is somehow, okay, uh, I mean if you take out these things, you see oh, EEG can see both and MEG can see only one and that is also could one reasons why MEG was took a quite a long time uh, before being accepted by the community, because you think oh, why should I spend a fortune to uh, uh, on, a, on a unit, on a system which can only give me a fraction okay, of the knowledge information there. And, and there are good reasons there, I mean yes you should, uh, you can say if you have a limited resources, okay, I, mean, uh, I mean there is little point there and there are still some classic or people f each from the electron cellular community, they still do not accept MEG, okay, there they think oh, that is no point of buying or investing so much of money, okay. But it, it gives certain benefit you would see there and especially here also because the EEG uh, picks up both, so it does not have or it is more sensitive to the, to the, to the radial, but if you are really expecting your n effects there in the tangential or in the sulci there, then definitely MEG is a much better bet. But if you are doing an experiment, suppose uh, one comes to my mind, the feedback related negativity that is called FRN, this is an ERP component, whenever suppose you perform an action and then I give you a feedback on your performance there. And if I tell you, oh you have to improve there and usually uh, we learn by incorporating this feedback and there is a certain brain responses which we call the feedback related negativity and uh, that is generated in the primarily in the mid frontal areas whenever we receive a wrong feedback or a feedback that tells us to improve there, that is related with how we learn. And those, this is a very crucial component because that somehow related with our learning and this FRN which is an EEG or ERP component is generated in the mid frontal areas and that is not tangential. So, if you are using MEG in the to study FRN that would not be a good bet there. So, you have to choose okay, your methods based on what you want to find because there is nothing like one best method for everything there. You have to know what purpose a method is good for and what when it cannot serve your function. It does not matter even if you spend 3 million uh, dollar, you may end up with a suboptimal outcome. So, I already mentioned to you okay, the here, so this is the just a schematic that is radius dipole, that is a tangential dipole, so okay, here and, and this tangential dipoles seen on MEG, okay, EEG, radial dipole is not much seen on MEG is a primarily seen on EEG. So, this is the fold here, so that is why you can see that is where the brain fold this is a schematic. So, just where the brain folding that is a sulci, that is where the, the, the dipole becomes tangential and that is where uh, MEG is more powerful. Okay. So, what further whether EEG or MEG? If you are interested in understanding uh, high frequency activities, then MEG is a slightly better bet there, because the EEG, the way EEG system works that okay there because it picks up activities not just from the uh, the neural assemblies underlying the regions, but a kind of sum or average over many regions. So it's already acting like a special filter, and any filter we know uh, or averaging is like equivalent to low pass filter there. So naturally you are less likely to pick up high frequency activity from standard EEG amplifier. On the other hand, magnetic fields, okay, they pass through the skull and the scalp with, without much distortion. Electrical field, they are much attenuated there. So, electrical fields are also volume conducted through these tissues, cerebrospinal fluid, which not only, I mean the attenuated especially the high frequencies much more than the attenuated the low frequencies. So, if you are looking at the brain rhythms higher than 70 hertz, EEG is very difficult, you can do with a advanced instrumentation, you can do, 
but not any standard EEG system. But MEG, yes, you can just the way it works. Uh, Okay, so the another important point is that if you are interested in okay, whether you want to choose whether you want to go with an EG or MEG. We talked about yesterday that it is diff it is a very difficult problem to localize your neural activity from the distribution of potential that we call source reconstruction. MEG also has some problem, but usually MEG offers a better and slightly more accurate source reconstruction than EEG. Principally, they should have a very similar, but practically this advantage comes mainly because MEG on, a, on, on practical cases you have more MEG sensors than EEG electrodes, because standard MEG system has 306, because 102 I told you the 102 kind of positions and each position has 3 pickup coils. So, you have a 306 pickup coils and standard EEG you have a 64. And we told already yesterday, if you have a more sensors, you have a better spatial sampling, then your source reconstruction is tend to be better there. And also with MEG, you have a more precise locations of the, uh, of the sensors and you also have a better forward model. We will talk about forward model later, but briefly forward model is you uh, allocate your dipoles on the scalp there or dipole in the brain and then you are estimating what will be my field distributions, what will be my electrical potential distributions. So, as if as you if are assuming this is in the brain at these regions the brains are active. Now, let us see how the signal would look like on the sensor space that is called the forward model that is easier part there because you already started where in the brain you are you are locating your source and then using biophysical modeling uh, using the, all these approximations how the signal propagates along these different layers and then you solve the problem there is no uncertainty once you identify the location of the sources and then you just want to measure how what the signal will look like on the skull. The more problematic is the inverse problem there we call the backward pro backward model and that is what we have, because usually what we have, we have only the EEG signal there. We do not know exactly where in the brain it is located there. We only have the distribution of the potential over the scalp. And now, we want to find what are the solutions and it is very simple three body problems. So, now, once we have there are more than okay, a, a three sources, you cannot, you do not have the uniqueness. And also, on the top of it, there are infinite, I mean there is no uniqueness to the solution, there are infinite local combinations of sources which can generate the same distributions that you get. That is the inverse problem that is a problematic there. That we will cover a little bit later not today that how with a certain assumptions you can solve also inverse problem and get an estimate where in the brain very likely the sources are located which gives rise to the distribution of either the electrical potentials or the magnetic field that you are picking up. And MEG provides you a slightly better uh, uh, inverse model as well as forward model. So, means e it offers you a slightly better, slightly more accurate source reconstruction. Some other practical aspects, I just give you this one because you, you are primarily your interest in EEG okay, here and MEG is, is a quite close, I mean it is a close cousin of EEG. So, it's, this is always we compare. So, what, where it, we should go for MEG or why we should stick to the EEG. If your task is somehow, okay, you are, you need to take out your system uh, or EEG or MEG outside the lab, okay, so means portability, MEG is not portable. Current, as I mentioned, current technology, we do not, we have not reached that stage yet, but EEG is portable. You can have an EEG in, in a small, okay, any, you, you can put a good EEG in, in a backpack actually there, but MEG is uh, there is no question about that. So, if your portability is your important point that okay, you have to record there is no point doing MEG. MEG is also much more as I mentioned much more expensive to buy and to maintain although that expense is not cannot be a main factor of doing science, I mean not principally. MEG is one advantage is quicker to record, because if you remember yesterday we talked about if you want to do an EEG you have to put the electrodes, put the gel there, you have to make sure all the contacts are there. MEG you do not need to do that, 
uh, it is already you just have to put the helmet and make sure the helmet is rightly placed there. So, it does not require any skull preparation putting the cap electro gel so forth whatsoever. So, it saves a lot of time although it is practical you think just saving a time may not be that good, but it is a big advantage suppose if you are working with patients there the patients or, or working with okay, uh, vulnerable populations where they do not they usually they are less cooperative or some people okay, they do not also like all these things on your cap on your head there images are less intrusive there you just sit there something going to come very big over it okay, and you are not allowed to move yes that is it, but otherwise uh, for, for the in the clinical settings there especially for certain group of patients. Uh, MEG offers practical, uh, I would say, a practical benefit. And the last one, the, which is quite, that is, I think, quite a selling point, the EEG requires a reference because it is a potential. You always need to need a reference. And this choosing a reference is fraught with difficulties because there is no one best reference there. We know it is a kind of very difficult, I mean researchers often kind of could not agree which could be the better reference, we just follow the convention. That is what I said, just check it, what are the other papers did that, I mean use the same reference scheme, so that you can compare your outcome to others. But MEG is a magnetic field, you do not need a reference there, so you do not need a reference site. So, that is a, a kind of quite a plus point there for, for the MEG. And finally, okay, just to sum it up for the EEG. Uh, MEG. So, this is actually quotation which I like it very much by, by the guy who actually came up this the father of MEG. He says averaged over the entire head MEG sees less than EEG does that we already discussed because EEG sees both radial and tangential MEG only sees tangential, but MEG sees less than EEG does, but it sees a bit better there. So, now this is definitely a kind of up to the choice okay, of the experimenter okay, if he has the resources he has the resources then yes, why not there. So, that is why I think 20, 20 I mean India still do not have, but even in Europe 20, 20 years back, uh, even in United States there is a possibly 20 years back less than 5 MEG 20 years back, that because people or researchers think no, why should I invest so much of money there. It was mainly pick, uh, po quite popular in, in, in Finland, so that many of the big companies are based in Finland, they are the kind of stalwart in the MEG, but now and for the last 10 years now, okay, I mean we, uh, there is a quite a strong trend of bringing different modalities, imaging modalities together. So, you can now combine EEG and MEG together actually, so that is where the recent trend. So, you can get best of the both worlds there. So, now they have uh, instrumentation has developed, so that you can use an EEG cap inside the MEG, uh, but you have to pay uh, the cost naturally, but there as I mentioned 20 years back there are only 5 labs possibly less than 5 labs in, uh, in America, but now there are possibly 50 labs in America they have MEG. So, it is picking up there, because we realize this helps gives you okay, uh, all this is very expensive, but gives you a certain signal in the brain with a higher sensitivity there. And if you combine with other techniques there, uh, then you get a much uh, better or cleaner picture. So, why am I doing that? In terms of artifacts as I mentioned, you get a very similar artifacts like EEG, on top of it additional a lot of ambient noise and other artifacts there. So, you get a blinking, any moving magnet materials, yeah those, those things are definitely problematic. Anything that if impl implant any metallic implantations, because it is a very mag magnetic field you are entering to and you do not want any metal to interfere with the recording which is very weak magnetic field. So, any dental work braces, surgical plates, even I heard that I do not know I am possibly sure there should be some research, even some uh, okay, you apply some makeup which has some metallic okay, that also interfere with MEG I heard, I mean I think there are some papers that are there. So, some makeups which has some metallic paint there, urban environment okay, I mean all these things are terrible there and on the top of it you have a wide band noise as well. So, definitely you have to remember you literally you are measuring signals almost at the noise floor there and the, now the job is how to extract uh, all these signals and the first is you are, as I mentioned you have to have the magnetically shielded room. So, if you take any this is the okay, uh, 
if you have any kind of schemata, what do you have? So, I mean, in a standard, I showed yesterday what a standard EG lab should have. So, this is a standard MEG lab should have. So, you need a magnetic shielded room. Well, you need a, at least four million dollar, uh, and then you need a magnetic shielding room. So, this is the big devoir. That's the one inside, and that's usually okay encased in this liquid helium. This big white you will see here. That's primarily nothing but the hel liquid helium cylinder, encasing your 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 squid. These are individual squid sensors. Uh, as a participant, you need again a stimulus computer there. It has to be uh, very tightly linked okay, with, your, with your MEG device. And you need, okay, I mean, naturally, all these powers are the DC powers, stimulus control, which is presenting the stimulus, and electronics, the controller, and filter amplifier, and so forth. So these are kind of pretty standard, and importantly, you need a magnetic shielding room. Everything should be RF shielded, magnetic shielded there. Okay. So, sum it up, kind of images, advantages, it is a non-invasive there. And although it is a from 3 to 4 million dollar, but still it is less expensive than fMRI, which is the other functional MRI, other dominant imaging modality. And it has offers excellent time resolution, as good as EEG, you can measure millisecond level precision of neural activities, reasonable spatial resolution, slightly better than EEG, it is worse than fMRI, but it is better than EEG there, and <coughs> it is also very sensitive to a particular uh, neural sources primarily in, in the sulci there. Disadvantage already mentioned this is a very expensive, you the maintenance cost, this is a high maintenance cost, not portable, subjects cannot move, okay, and it suffer from all the artifacts and EEG amplifier suffers on the top of other artifacts, and it cannot pick up activities from the radial sources. So, principally means if you are looking for activities for tangential dipoles from the surface levels, then image is a very good bet. If you are looking for activities from the deeper sources or from the radial dipoles, then no. So, that is the kind of take home message if you want to invest in MEG. Okay. So, I think I will give it a break here. Thank you. Sorry, sir. I did to Bosho Boshi Dito, let it be to Bathaja Bolo Bosho Boshi. What the post of the Thagbe Pore, I would put it up a gonta post to answer session. Sorry, I did to Bosho Boshi Dito. I mean, usually I don't like kind of sitting and talking, but somehow the back was not very cooperative. Back pain, okay. Now, with it, I should break dinner. Generally, post of our a gonta break, Napoleon.